Thank you, bro. It's good to be here with you guys. We're going to be working out of the book of Luke, chapter 7. If you want to go ahead and turn over there. I grew up in uh, Arkansas, a little town called uh, Pocahontas. Anybody know where that is? Okay, there's a few of you. probably got a speeding ticket when you went through there. Uh, used to be known for that. I think they cured that now. Um, but uh, I've spent more years now in Louisiana than I, uh, uh, than I did uh, in Arkansas. I grew up there. Uh, Randolph County, and uh, pretty small place. We did have one street light, just one flashing red light. And, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those places, the, the main street runs through the car wash, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of that big place, right? But I always appreciate being raised there. I appreciate being raised within uh, the church. My, uh, 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 we went to church all the time growing up. And I always said that I had a... Uh, that I had a drug problem. My dad drugged me to church on Sunday, drugged me to church on Wednesday, and we went to every gospel meeting and all these kinds of stuff. But what was odd was that my dad was not a Christian. My mom was, and she quit going. My dad wasn't, but he kept going. And so, uh, but by the way, there's a, there's a power in that about, about men uh, doing the right thing there. And so anyway... Uh, he kept taking, taking me to church, even though he wasn't a Christian. And so uh, I got up. I graduated high school. Uh, I remember pulling out of my driveway and looking, and my mom standing in the driveway crying because I'm leaving home. And, I'm, and, uh, and, and Dad, he, he, there's not much emotion there. It's just, all right, son, you know, you're on your way. And so I, I'm pulling out everything I own in the back of my car to drive the 40 miles to Jonesboro to go to college. And that was like leaving home, you know, that was a long way off. And I went to Arkansas State University. And I'm so glad I did because, uh, uh, of course, Chris, used, who used to be here, right, is there now at the student center. And back then, the student center was hopping. And uh, I moved there, and I, I, I wouldn't live, I never quit going to church, but I sure quit the Lord a long time. And so I was living totally in the world doing everything the world does, everything, and yet still I went to church because it was just drilled in me on Sundays. You get up and you go to church. So this idea, somebody says, well, you know, you, you, people who, you can't do that. You can't go to church all the time and live wrong. Well, you know, that's just not true. I did it a pretty good little bit. I'm telling you, it, you can do that. And I'll never forget the, uh, the guys at the student center, one particular guy named Gary Stevenson and Ron Ghost, and they would come and they would visit uh, my uh, apartment knock on the door and if they, they had visitation every Monday night and so we'd all s put the beer behind the couch till the preachers left you know and had our visit and whatever and got them on their way and Gary just kept inviting me I started going to the student center a little bit and then uh, I started kind of got into the Bible and all of a sudden you know they started sharing with me the gospel and then one night uh uh, the year I was there, we happened to be undefeated in, in football that year. My, two of my best buddies played football for them there. And uh, uh, on the way back from Memphis State University ball game, everybody had been drunk. And we were in the car, and I was in the back, and I was praying, God, just get me home. I'm going to turn this thing around. I, please don't let anything happen to me tonight. And they, we got in like at 4 in the morning, and I didn't even go to bed. I went in. I cleaned up. I I put my church clothes on, and I drove down to the parking lot at Southwest, and I sat out there, and I was on the car there waiting for people to come. And that night, I was baptized into Christ, and uh, I ain't looked back since. But the power of that student center works. I know you're involved in work here on campus. I'm telling you, it changes lives. And so the, all the effort and, and money and time and things that you put into people in the kids' lives, it turned my life around to have a student center group. Because then all the guys I, I, I live with in an apartment, they're all in the world, see? And so I can't really, I mean, I go back there and I live there, but like a big party come in, I can't stay there. And so I go and I sleep in the student center. 
And so it was just a lifesaver for me, the relationships and then the growth. And then one time Ron Gosen had me do a devotional and I did it. And, he, and he, then he pulled out this verse out of Luke that said, you know, he said, Mike, you know, have you ever thought about just really giving your heart to ministry? I said, are you kidding me? You know, uh, no, I've been giving my heart to two things, baseball and music, you know, which didn't quite go together, but that was what I was, you know, the two things I was doing. So he said, uh, uh, well, you know, the Bible says to whom much is given, much will be required. He, he laid that verse on me. And so a year later, I found myself in West Monroe, Louisiana, going to the Watch Fair Road School of Biblical Studies. And uh, there I met Susan. She worked in the church office. And so I'm the preacher that ran away with the church secretary. Because I found her and said, that's what I want. The elder that ran the office, then he ran me off a few times. But, uh, uh, but I persisted. And uh, we met in, uh, 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 met in September. I asked her out in October. Got engaged in February and married in June. And for, for you parents who are saying, I wish you wouldn't tell my kids that. Well, I, I wouldn't, but except that it worked out great for me. Now, I can't help it if she made a bad deal. I'm, I'm totally satisfied, right? Now, everybody's story is different. The one thing about my background, though, that, 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 that growing up in the church, I love the restoration movement because it said things like, just, let's just go to the Bible. Let's don't, let's don't be held back by anything. If we find something different in there, and I was taught that, if I find something different in there in the Bible I've never believed before, believe it. I took that as serious. And so all of a sudden, boy, the Bible study started opening up for me. And then I started looking at things. Because I was raised uh, uh, with an appreciation of the Bible and how it could change my life. But I was also raised with, a, with, with a, I don't say they were all legalistic, but with symptoms of legalism anyway. We, here's how it works. You know, Jesus, the Bible says, he came full of grace and truth, right? But here's what happened. With my raising, we shouted truth and we whispered grace. So I really didn't know any grace. Matter of fact, as a kid, my mom would knock on the door and say, Mikey, don't forget to say your prayer. By the way, you, you, you were not allowed to call me that, only a few people. Mikey, I was the youngest in the family. Don't forget to say your prayers. And I'd say my prayers, but I, was, I, I would thought, you know, if I say my prayers, i got to name every sin I did that day in order not to be lost. And then kind of a general statement of anything I hadn't, hadn't thought of. And I always had to say at the end of my prayer, what? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I had to say that physically for that prayer to get to heaven. I can remember going to sleep, praying, and, for, and not ending my prayer, waking up in the morning worried that my prayers didn't get there because I didn't say the formula. Now think about how miserable that is. And so it was, there was no assurance of eternal life. There was only doubt. And so what that makes you, that either makes you bitter and discouraged that you give up, or it makes you the self-righteous judge of everyone else who you're running around with. That's the only two things, that's the only two options you have, you see. And so I thought walking in the light was like walking a tightrope. And every time I stump my toe and say a bad word, I'm out of the light. And I have to say a quick prayer, Father, forgive me of that. And I'm back in the light. And I'm in and out of the light. And matter of fact, if I could just die with a communion cup in one hand, bread in the other, right before I, you know, kick off, just, you know, that'd be the only safest way. Matter of fact, really, if you just drown me in the baptistry, I'd know I'd make it. Any of you grow up like that? No assurance, no grace. And boy, when I discovered grace, and I discovered the book of Romans especially, really when I discovered Jesus, the person, then I could put away the doctrinal daggers that I threw at every other religious group and just be thankful that I've got, can learn myself and grow. Right? And so that's, that's kind of my, that's kind of my story. And it's still an ongoing story. I'm still growing I'm still learning I've got a whole bunch to learn but at least now I'm confident not because of anything I've done only because of the gospel which is the story of the death burial and resurrection of Jesus that good news is what saves me and it's by God's grace that I'm saved so I can lay my head on my pillow tonight and know 100% for sure 
is God came. Jesus comes busting through the cloud. I'm all right. Because of me? No. I've never do enough good. I don't work in order to be saved. I work because I am saved. And that changed everything about my story. And so one of the things I love to do is help people find assurance and grace when they've missed it for so long. But that's kind of a hard battle. Well, Jesus loved to do that. And in this story, in Luke chapter 7, he's got a couple of people he's trying to help. Let's just read the text there of Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36 here. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And when a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she, bought a, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She, then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, you get that? He turned toward the woman, but he says to Simon, got that? You met people like that? They look at somebody else while they're talking to you, all right? Do you see this woman? I came into your, I, I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not pour, pour, uh, put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests begin to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, there's two people in this story that I call untouchable. One is the woman. She's untouchable because of her unrighteousness. The religious people didn't want to have anything to do with her. She's, uh, she's unclean. She's, uh, now, it says she was a sinful woman. By the way, you notice it doesn't name her sin. Most commentators say it was prostitution, but it could have been any sin that she's known for in town. Maybe it, was a, maybe it was the town gossip. Maybe she was the town drunk. Maybe she was the town drug dealer. Maybe she was the town uh, merchant that, that, that cheated everybody and got wealthy off of it. I don't know, but we'll go with the commentators. I mean, they, they typically think it was the, the town prostitute. But, but whatever her situation, she's untouchable. Now the, but the Pharisee, he's untouchable too. Because he's untouched by this woman's brokenness and the sadness of her life when he should have been touched by that. Both two untouched people. And Jesus makes an effort to touch both of them. Now, the old Pharisee, he's a religious guy. He's got Jesus into his house. But now we know from earlier in the text, he's not really having him there to learn from. He's, he's got some other things. He's, he's looking for ways to accuse him of some stuff. Matter of fact, the Pharisee, he's already rejected John's teaching, it says earlier in chapter 7. He's already rejected the baptism of John and the preaching that was going out about turn, uh, turn your life around, repentance, and all those things, and, and, and they rejected it. But here he is with Jesus. And all of a sudden, this woman comes in uninvited to this dinner. And she, all of a sudden, think about this. Her hair she takes down, her tears wet his feet, she wipes, she cries, she kisses, and then she takes this perfume and pours on him. All those things she used to use in the world 
for her trade. Now she uses for her Lord. Got it? That's her story. He totally transforms her life. She comes in boldly to worship. Look, I mean, she knows she's a sinful woman in town, right? But she comes in. She comes in boldly. She comes in honestly. She comes in humility. The worship that she displays there is unbelievable that she would just be like that. This woman comes bursting into this, in, into this house. No, she comes bursting into this church. And down your aisle at the invitation, a sinful woman everybody knows to worship God. What's the response? Let me tell you, which one do I look like the most? Do I look like the Pharisee in my worship? Or do I look like the woman? Which story am I? And to be honest with you, I, I, I'm both of them. I've been like both of them. I mean, there are times that I've been self-righteous and, and, and judgmental, and I'm, gonna, I'm the Pharisee, and I've got all the answers. And then there's the time that, that sin's just it's so heavy, and you're broken, and you're just at the feet of, of Christ. And I love what Jesus does and that he offers both of them the way to connect to him. The woman didn't come for a customer. She came for worship. What will it take to get those kinds of people in our church? What will it take to get the people in town that live that kind of lifestyle in this room? To where in their brokenness and their sadness, they can find forgiveness of sin. Here a while back we had a uh, we had a visitor come in from West Texas. You know, tattooed up pretty good, which is not real unusual in our church. But uh, Susan met him. She's one of the greeters. They were sitting by her, and they were telling her a story. One of our guys got up and did, did the communion talk and talked about how God had changed his life and and. Uh, he'd been an alcoholic and had drug problems and stuff, and his life really changed. And so they're like, look, they're meeting Greek. They're like talking to us. We want to meet this guy because we went with this church, accepts everybody. So, yeah. And so she, they told the story about a church they tried to visit and that they would not let her come in unless she wore long sleeves to cover up her tattoos. And I thought, are you kidding I mean, that's the people we want in this room. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. The righteous don't need a doctor. It's the sick, right? And the healthy doesn't need one. It's the unrighteous people. And so we said, yeah, because we, we have a thing we say all the time. That, watch her, we love everybody. Say that with me. We love everybody. And that's what we want our church to be known for in the community. There's a guy converted there several years ago. His name's Richie. And Richie had been, uh, he'd been a drug addict. He had, had some messed up family. And so he decides he wants to try to change. And so he, he, that morning he got up and he said, I'm going to try to look for a change in my life. And he went to a, a restaurant. And the girl there met him and invited him to, to Watch Ferry Road. And he said, well, I might have to go there sometime. I don't know. I've never been there. And so then he goes somewhere else, and somebody else invited him. He got two invites that day to the same church. The third one, he said, now, well, I know this other preacher. I'm going to go visit him. So he goes and visits this preacher, and the preacher says, look, I don't, I don't know what to do with your situation, but that church at Washington Road, they'll take anybody. Why don't, you, know, you might try down there. And so that's how we got Richie May. He's been with us ever since. What's real funny he used to get drugs illegally crossing the border, and he never got caught. Well, he, he gets converted and goes with our Mexico medical team the other way, and what do they do? They stop him in the van and hold him there. And he's like, when I did it illegal, I said, I do it legally. Now they're stopping me, you know. But here he is taking the message of the gospel back in to a country that, that needs it so desperately. His story is amazing. But his story is only great because of the story of Jesus. See, this, this woman found forgiveness. Can you imagine to hear 
the word spoke from Jesus himself. You are forgiven. Actually, he says, your many sins are forgiven. What a great thing to hear. And unfortunately, the Pharisee couldn't, he couldn't hear it. Because he really didn't think he had many sins. That's the problem. She understood she had many. She understood her brokenness. And she understood her need. You see, she didn't need a sermon. She just needed a Savior. And that is exactly what she found. See, the only one, the one in this story that got changed was the worshiper. Pharisee wasn't there worshiping. She was. And sometimes a great worship and brokenness transforms people. Matter of fact, Paul even wrote in Corinthians, right, when the church is worshiping and an unbeliever walks in and sees the right kind of worship, they'll say, wow, God must be here. That's the kind of worship we ought to have. But that's a worship that comes from people who understand their own brokenness and appreciation for the forgiveness and the grace that God's given them. I want you to look at uh, another passage with me over in Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, the Hebrew writer says this, See to it that no one misses the grace of God. Got it? See to it that no one misses the grace of God. So when there's, a, when there's someone in the church that... that uh, uh, acts ugly or doing, doesn't do what's right and you, and you notice it and you, you think, man, I need, to, I need to go to them. Well, you go to them, but go to them with the spirit that says, you know what, I need, to, I need to see to it they don't miss the grace of God. When there's been a church conflict and you don't quite know how to handle it and you go to talk to somebody, you go with them with the attitude, I need to see to it that they don't miss the grace of God. I don't want anyone to miss out on God's grace, do you? See, I'm not going to them like the Pharisee to say in my, to be a mind reader. Remember, he was a mind reader. He said, if Jesus, only, if Jesus knew what this woman was, why, he wouldn't be talking to her. Well, if he's a prophet, he ought to know that. He's reading his mind. Of course, Jesus is reading his too, right? See to it no one misses God's grace. You're teaching a Bible class. Whatever you teach, you see to it. No one misses the grace of God. Your young people and your teenagers, your college guys, whatever you teach them, you make sure they get the gospel done. You make sure you see to it. They do not miss the grace of God. Our mission efforts around the world, when we go and teach people, don't be so caught up in the structure that you miss the grace of God. I was studying with a woman one time where she came to talk to me about something that had changed in the assembly. You know, if you mess around with the assembly, you know, it's kind of, you know, problematic, right? Because we, we all have our things about how we do church, right? As a matter of fact, some of you are sitting in the same place you always sit. Is that right? Huh? Some of you got your pew, you know, and now you don't say it's your pew, you don't write your name on it, but if you walk in and somebody's in it, you're like, hmm, I wish I hadn't got my pew, you know, right? We all got our own little things. So this lady said, Mike, I just feel like when you change the assembly, I feel like, I feel like I've come home and somebody's moved all my furniture around. Got it? I said, I get it. I get that. I said, why do you think that is? She said, I don't know. It just doesn't feel like it's proper church if we do things in a different order, if we do things. I said, well, in other words, the structure of the thing gives you stability. They said, yeah, that's right. I said, well, that, okay, I got it. Because we've taught 
people that for so long that the structure is what gives them stability. And so I said, here's, so here's my goal then. I want to move you to where your stability is found in the Savior, not the structure. Because the body of Christ is an is a organism, not an organization. And it's going to be changing and growing as it goes because of people we convert and because of cultures we live in. Things are going to change. And, 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 the, and you know, you may do church. I don't know. What, do you, what time do you do church here on Sunday morning? Nine o'clock? The scriptural time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, you, you ever try to move that time? Well, I mean, that's, that's a little less. Matter of fact, by the way, do you know how come we started meeting at 9 or 10 o'clock in rural America years ago? Because you had to have time to get the chores done. Everybody lived on farms, and you had to feed the animals and get all that done before you came to church. That's how we got our church time in America. Matter of fact, uh, uh, you'd ride to church in a wagon, and there'd be dust on those roads, and so they would close up those collars and, and, and tie a tie around it. That's how we got the tie. And what was, once, what was once was practical became formal and then for some even doctrinal. Because I've been at churches where you couldn't wait on the table if you didn't have a tie on. Now, if you're at our church and have a tie on, somebody knows you're visiting because uh, now if you have camouflage on, you fit right in. Uh, matter of, it's funny, we do Duck Commander Day, and uh, 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 it's just an outreach into the community, and everybody wears camouflage, and, uh, and so it's just the whole, the, the whole group, every, every staff member, every greeter, everybody's in camouflage. And so, uh, and people who are visiting that day, and they don't know, what, they don't know that's what the day is, they're like, oh, man, I should have got something camouflage. You know, then they're feeling bad. You know, the pressure goes the other way around. Matter of fact, one time we got a stockbroker, uh, and uh, 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 his, he's one of our elders. His name is Randy. And so, and Phil Robertson was in the audience. And so, well, me and Alan were doing a lesson out of the book of James, you know, about where a wealthy guy comes in and you set him up front. And, and so, we said, now, don't get this mixed up. Said, but we had Randy stand up and said, Randy, how much did your three-piece three suit you got on right there cost, you know? And so, Randy starts telling what his shoes cost. And then, all right, we added that up. And then we said, Phil, what about what, uh, what your camouflage stuff? Well, you know, he had on the nice camouflage. His stuff was more expensive than the suit, you know. But what I love about the worship at our church, well, Cy is the one I love. Cy sings the loudest of anybody in our church. He doesn't sing the best, but he sings the loudest. But he loves to worship. And he'll come early just to be around the worship team just to sing with them as they're going through songs because he just loves to worship. And I love that about him. And kids come in, they crawl up in his lap, and they hug, and they love him. And that they're, but because, but it, there's, that, there's that attitude of worship. I just want to be there worshiping God. There's something about this woman in her brokenness that just wants to bow down and kiss Jesus' feet and embrace him and worship God. And in this worship experience... Her life is transformed. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. I don't want them to miss it. I, I, I missed it for a long time. And basically, when you miss grace, you give up because you realize you can't live perfect. You know, 1 John... 513 said, these things have I written to you that you may know you have eternal life. You can know you have it. The problem is we learn it intellectually here, but from here to here is a long distance. To go from the head to the heart is a long distance, especially if being raised that you really can't know. Hope in the Bible is an expectation of something that's already there for you. Hope isn't like a, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope I make it. It's not that. A hope is a confidence and a certainty that what God has promised, He's able also to perform. 
And that's what we have in the story of Jesus. He gives her hope. And she finds grace in all of her brokenness. Now, can you imagine what her story became after that? Everybody in town, probably some not believing it yet. Because look at this, look at the, even the wealthy gift that she poured on his feet. She's given her all. Can you imagine the next day somebody walking up and saying, tell me, what was that like? What was it like when you met Jesus? I would love to have heard her story compared to the Pharisee. I hope that after he saw it and pondered it, I hope he came around. I don't know his situation. Jesus Christ came from heaven, become a flesh, a man for us. Died on the cross. Romans says, while we were yet sinners. Even while we were sinning, Christ died for us. Was buried. His body came out of that ground. He went back to heaven to help us in life. And one day he's coming again. That message of the gospel is what changes hearts. So that story, when that when I'm baptized into Christ, his story becomes my story. Got it? I put him on in baptism. He's my Lord and Savior. I still mess up, but he's constantly trying to conform me to look like him. Because Christianity and all of its simple Uh, uh, simpleness is me becoming more like Jesus today than I was the day before and how I act and how I live and how I treat people and so that message of the gospel is what changed people's lives this woman got to see it firsthand and put her hands there you and I we put our hands around the story of Jesus and the gospel and we bring our brokenness to him And he changes our lives just like he changed hers. And he could say physically to us, just as he said to her, your many sins are forgiven. Go in peace. So when you walk out of here tonight, if you're in Christ, I don't want you to walk out with any doubt. I want you to walk out saying, I am forgiven I'm going in peace. Because then you'll have a story you'll tell other people. You see, you won't tell people a story that you're not sure of. When I was real little, this is the difference between conforming and transforming. Conforming is pressure from without. You take somebody, I, I did youth ministry for years and years. You take a teenager, has a filthy mouth, whatever. You put him in a Devo, he won't cuss the whole time. He's in the Devo. And when he leaves, well, he'll go, you know, do whatever. All right? That's conformity. Transforming is what happens. Uh, that's the Romans 12 passage. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed. That happens from the inside out. Transformed by the renewing of our mind. But, boy, we give, in the, we give in to that pressure from the outside so much. When I was a little boy, real little, I had two older brothers. Mom just throwed us all in the tub together, right? And I wasn't old enough to know this thing about holding your breath underwater. I, I hadn't learned that yet. They're, so they're, they're doing this contest. And my, uh, my brother Gary said, time me. Uh, I'm gonna, I can hold my breath in longer than you can. So he'd hold his breath in the water, and my brother would count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, you know. And then they'd get it, and he'd come up, and then, and then it'd be Rick's turn. He'd say, oh, you count me. And so he'd go underwater, and Gary would count 1,001, 1,001. He'd, you know, he'd cheat a little bit, 1,002. And then Rick would come. I'm like, let me do it. I can do it. No, no, you can't do it. Yeah, I can. And so I said, can And so I went under, and I went just like this. Ugh, I mean, mouth wide open. It's a soap sud thing, you know? And they get in my mouth, and I'm, I'm coughing and spitting. And, and so my brother takes the wash rag and tries to wipe out the suds. Well, the more you wipe, guess what happens? Just the more suds are coming everywhere. And so I finally pass out over the edge of the bathtub. 
And my, they're hollering from my mom, and she comes in, and she grabs me by the feet and holds me upside down, shaking me. My bro oldest brother, Gary, he knows he's responsible, so he's hollering, please don't let him die. Please don't let him die. And so she takes me outside on the front porch to get air. I never wanted to see a neighbor again. <laughs> Why would you do something like that? What conformity? I got to be like everybody. Transformation? No, that's from the inside out. That's what happened with this woman. She had been transformed by her worship experience with Jesus. Now, that's the kind of worship service I'd like to be a part of, wouldn't you? Now, that good news we want to make sure everybody gets. I want to I show you a video here. And uh, then I'll get up with a couple of concluding remarks. But on this video is the story of what it's the story of a of a family that we actually fed out of the benevolent room. Uh, Kay Robertson, we fed their family while Phil was off running around before they were ever converted out of our benevolent room. But Phil's sister Jan was so determined. To get him to Jesus. And her determination makes all the difference in the world as you see the progression of one person telling the good news, telling the good news, telling the good news. Let's watch this. There was nine in our family. My mom brought so many people to the Lord. And uh, she brought all of her brothers and sisters to the Lord. All my life, it's been really important to me to tell people about Jesus. I wanted my brother to know the gospel. I knew he was so strong, I mean, and, and a leader. He was going to lead you, either good or bad, but he was, he was going to lead. Well, I needed some help, and I knew who would be that help, would be Bill Smith. I just started asking him to come. I said, I want you to meet my brother. And uh, I actually nagged him, <laughs> just begged him. And I'd say, please go see my brother with me. And he did. She called me, he called me, he called me. So Jan just kept asking me, would, would I go talk to him? After uh, about a month of her constantly asking me, then she said, he said he had to you. So I'm excited about getting to talk to Phil. I knew his reputation. So when I got there, he went chicken. It aggravated me, to, to be frank. I asked, where, where, where is he? I said, he was down at the bar. And I said, well, I'm heading down that way. I walked out their, their door and down this hill down to the uh, tavern. I said, Robinson? He says, Smith? And I went in and started talking to him it's one of those occasions where we both liked each other. And so then when we finished the, the, the study, uh, we took him down and baptized him. He's the same Phil, except the Holy Spirit's in him. I praise God for what he's doing for the Lord's kingdom. It changed their lives. It changed Kay's life. It changed their kids' lives. I mean, it was like... It's just, it was unbelievable to, to watch. It was like a miracle. And it's just, you're just watching this total change. And no one comes to his house and leave, and they don't leave without knowing, without hearing the gospel. I mean, it is, it is his life. He's a special guy that God has, I really believe, picked to, to help people to find him. My life before Jesus, ha, I basically just got high, got laid, got drunk. That was kind of the big three. My problem at 28, I didn't know what my problem was. That was the problem. Before I met Jesus, I didn't know that Satan controlled me. I didn't know that. In a moment of weakness, or maybe on God's part, I sat down and what I heard the good news about Jesus stunned me. I said, let me get this right. Freed from Satan, 
freed from sin, freed from guilt. Whew, that's a big one. Peace of mind, freed from law. You don't have to be perfect anymore. And finally, free from the grave. That's what Jesus does. I'm thinking, uh, that'd be a home run. I'm rich and I'm somewhat famous, but neither one of those things can remove my sin or raise me from the dead. They can't help me at all. Therefore, I prioritized Jesus and the blood he shed for my rotten sins and the resurrection. I am thankful to the Almighty for rescuing me from that hell hole. Never arrived, but I'm a lot better than I was. So from there, since I had heard it, I thought, well, one thing's for sure, I'm gonna try my best to make sure that all these poor souls weren't in the same shape I was in. If it's up to me, I'm gonna make sure they know at least the story about Jesus. I'm gonna try to get it in their ears if they'll listen. Amazingly, Tens of thousands have responded in a positive way to Jesus, the Son of God. Therefore, I take them one at a time, try to help them. I was helped at 28. I'm now 69, one year shy of 70. So I've been at that for about the last 41 years. Mike Owens had the drive and the fire and the love for his fellow man. And he told me, he said, listen, Robson, every time you have a Bible study, I want to be sitting there. You all get together, and a lot of people being converted. He said, I don't know how to convert someone. He sat in on every Bible study we had for about a year, which was a lot. And after about a year, he said, I got it. I said, well, get after it. Well, he took off, and to this day, he's still going. That guy knows how to operate. I'm just sitting in there always listening. I said, that's a good one there, honest. Growing up in the 60s and 70s, you know, drugs was just a part of the culture. And even though I grew up in the church and had a good home, I decided to leave because I really didn't see, from my perspective, a church that was real or where people could really discuss real problems. And so I left the church and uh, ended up in a pretty nasty methamphetamine habit. I would stay awake for days at a time. And one particular week after I'd been awake for a whole week, I came in on a Sunday morning to uh, just crash. And as I laid in bed there pretending to be asleep, our youngest daughter, Callie, came up to me. She was four years old at the time, just stood beside the bed. And I really pretended to be asleep and tried not to hear what she said. But what she said were words that just changed my life. How come daddy doesn't do anything with us anymore? How come he doesn't go to church with us anymore? And she said, well, if he doesn't go, then I'm not going either. It was my moment of clarity, the moment where everything became clear. I knew that I was taking my whole family down with me, not just killing me, I was killing everybody that I claimed to love. I married my wife. Came in, I told her, I said, look, I want to change. And she said, okay, would you talk to Ray? Well, Ray happened to be the preacher here at the time. I said, I guess I'll talk to him. And he came over that day he said, Mac, you really don't have to go in front of the whole church and tell everything you've done, but it might help somebody else that's struggling with the same thing. We thought we'd get told not to come back. They came around us, they hugged us, they loved us on us, they cried with us, and they said, you're our first drug addict. We don't know quite what to do with you, but we want you to keep coming back. And those are the words I heard loud and clear. Phil Robertson went to church here, so I said, I'll just talk to him because I hear that he goes and shares the gospel with a lot of people, and I'm thinking that I need to learn that. Well, it wasn't long before I knew every one of those scriptures by heart. And I thought, you know what? I can share this with other people. Then all of a sudden, I started sharing with other people as well. And so when I found out about Celebrate Recovery, saw what they were doing and saw that this ministry was for anybody with a hurt, habit, or hang-up. And so we started Celebrate Recovery. We gave people a place to belong. You know, I tell people all the time that drugs and alcohol really weren't my problem. It was my solution. Jesus Christ is my solution today. I am a believer in Jesus Christ first, who has been transformed by His grace, and I'm the national director for Celebrate Recovery. 
You know, you're fortunate in life when you find other people who have the same passion and fire and desire that you have. Uh, they can't keep quiet about what Jesus has done for them. And Chad Johnson is one of those individuals. We would share the gospel with people at my shop all the time. And I lived on a lake. We'd share the gospel with people and go down to the swamp, you know, clear out all the cypress leaves and tupla gum balls and, ba and water moccasins, you know, and then baptize them right down there in the lake behind the house. In Celebrate Recovery, we're always trying to find ways to plug newcomers in. And so one of the ways Chad came up with was he said, you know what? He said, I'm just going to take some of these new guys fishing after Celebrate Recovery. It immediately makes a bond, and that person feels like, wow, I'm valuable here. They want to do something with me. When you find somebody that's like-minded, to share with them the fire that you have, and then watch it ignite in them, and see them take off. And now, it still excites me to see him so excited about what Jesus has done for him. And the things you have heard me say. In the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of many witnesses. In trust. In trust to reliable men. To reliable men who will also be qualified. Will also be qualified. To teach others. To teach others. Now it's my turn. You never know what one person you convert will be multiplied to reach so many more people. They did a, uh, they did a Duck Commander cruise a couple years ago, the first one they did. So Alan, the oldest son, who he, he and I preached together for eight years until he went full-time with the company, but he was trying to talk Phil into going on the cruise. Phil don't want to leave the house for nothing. And he said, why would I want to be trapped on a boat with 3,000 people? Alan said, Dad, you got it wrong. You're going to get to preach, and you got 3,000 people who can't get away. He said, oh, okay, I'll go. You know, on that cruise, they baptized over 200 people. They had multiple guys in the water. I wish I'd have brought a picture of it of them as, as he's preached the gospel and just continually baptizing folks. The crew said, well, we, can, we don't ever get to hear him because we're all working. Phil, do you think you could preach and, and teach sometime with us? And he said, well, when, when you get off, they said, one in the morning. He said, all right, I'll be there. So he went in the middle of the night and preached to, that, to the crew that worked on the ship. It's, it's not about special talents or opportunities. Nobody's more valuable than anybody else in the kingdom. You just, it's just always our goal. We're just one beggar telling another beggar where to find the bread of life. But don't sell yourself short. You can be used to affect people's lives. And the one person you invite, you might be an inviter. Somebody else might be the guy that studies. Somebody else might be the person that feeds them and has them in their house. Uh, the Pharisee probably never thought he was doing something that gave an advantage to winning somebody to Jesus that night. Probably never thought about it. You never know what opportunities are right around the door. Uh, so ask the Lord for opportunities. Boldly walk into them. He'll give you whatever you need at the time you need it. It'll be okay. You're not going to mess anything up. And uh, invite people to hear the story of Jesus. And when you change one life, who knows how that might be multiplied from generation to generation. You know what? That's pretty exciting. I'm going to end with one more quick story. The first person to ever baptize. We were on a campaign in Omaha, Nebraska. I'd just been converted. The Arkansas State took a group up there knocking doors. I was nervous. I studied with this guy. He was a, 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 I never, he was a tall, red-headed teenager. I studied the gospel with him, uh, uh, and uh, he, he wanted to be baptized. It was Wednesday night after church. So everybody had already gone, and so we got in the baptistry, and he was scared of water. You know, he was all nervous. So we get in the baptistry. I'm nervous myself, 
and the preacher's standing right side on the, ed- uh, on, the, on the front of the edge and a couple other people, and there's a little glass front on there. And so I go to baptize him, and when I do, he grabs a hold of the glass, and I've got him under the water. And the preacher's trying to get his fingers off the glass, you know. He's doing this right here. And he's starting to bubble. I'm thinking, i got to bring him up, you know. And so I bring him back up. But, you know, I was raised in the Church of Christ. All parts of the body got to go under at the same time, right? So I grabbed his hand, and I took him to the bottom, you know. <laughs> Scared the kid to death. But I'll tell you, I'll never forget it because... The feeling that somehow or another I got to be a part of being used uh, in someone finding Jesus. That, that's something that will never leave me. And God desires to use the whole body, whatever your talents and abilities are, to help people have that experience of finding Jesus. Father, we love you. Thank you for this group. Thank you for the church here. And I remember being here many, many years ago at Christ Teens and seeing so many people influenced. I thank you for their work and their mission. And I pray a great blessing on all their efforts and all the ministry. Thank you, Father, for how you're using them in the kingdom. Increase them greatly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.